This conference will now be recorded. I'm sorry, I wanna make sure we record it for those that aren't here. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for this opportunity uh, to, to share what we've been doing over the last uh, several years. It's a big team effort. And- uh, sorry. sorry, Justin, one more thing. Uh, I apologize to everybody. This was intended to be an informal webinar and I'm showing that it is. Um, just want to say that we we did pick uh, go to meetings so that you all have the ability to ask questions easily and it's not all um, controlled through a questions panel. Uh, so we have a chat box which will allow you to uh, pose a question there and I can ask it uh, as we go along. Or the other option for you, if you'd like to, and if you have a longer question or want to back and forth, if you'd like to speak with a question, if you could just type hand in the chat. That'll give us a running log of who's in the queue to, to speak. Uh, and so we'll do we'll sort of handle the in, interaction that way. And we really do want to encourage you to ask questions and be this is intended to be interactive. But let me ask Justin, how would you all like to get questions along the way? Or would you want to pause and then ask for them at a certain time? Or what's your preference? Uh I think I think uh once we once I break, we can go through the questions. Yeah, so let's just collect them in the chat and then we can go through it uh, once once I pause. Yeah, so again, put them in, write it in the chat or just write the word hand and I'll call on you in, in that order. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, really the goal of this is to provide a high level overview uh, of uh, climate engine, some hands-on examples um, with the research app and also the API. So I'm gonna go over uh, some motivation and background, highlight some examples of how NOAA, BLM, and others uh, state agencies have used it. Um, go over the general layout, um, demo the app, and, and do some hypothesis testing, that's always fun. Um, and then pass it over to Jody, uh, who will um, go through the API and Swagger uh, Query Builder and demo it. Uh, and then pass it over to, to Kristen to uh, demo and go over uh, Google Colab and some Python notebook examples of the API, and then uh, do some uh, question and answer and some exploration. Uh, so a little bit about me. <clears throat> I'm a research professor at the Desert Research Institute uh, of, of Hydrology and Remote Sensing. Um, I started my professional career at the Nevada State Engineer's Office as a hydrologist um, back in, uh, 2005 and and at that time you know we we're still paying for landsat data we didn't have um uh, ready access to a lot of gridded data if we had prism and and maybe one or two others um, but we were spending a ton of time uh, downloading and processing data locally um, and also having a really difficult time quantifying uh characterizing drought uh irrigation impacts uh, uh from the drought uh, and um, I, I went to uh, the Desert Research Institute uh, in, in 2009 and really started to focus on drought impacts and use of uh, large data sets to get at evapotranspiration, uh, evaporative demand, uh, and place-based drought uh, uh, impacts. And <clears throat> that work uh, really started to evolve and um, the 2012 through 2015 drought really uh, started to take hold and get a lot of attention when several water bodies in our region, um, Western Nevada dried up, rivers were drying up. Uh, the governor at the time, Governor Brian Sandoval declared a drought emergency. He was the chair of the Western Governors Association at that time and got uh, uh, the Western Governor's Drought Form together. And at that time, we didn't have a California, Nevada drought early warning system. Um, and so the drought really spurred the creation of the California, Nevada dews uh, uh, through NIDUS. And um, it was some of this new technology that we had been developing uh, got rolled into the NIDUS Reauthorization Act in 2018 that directed NIDUS to provide timely data, assess new technologies to improve processing speed, improve subseasonal forecasts, continue drought monitoring activities. Uh, and what was really cool is that it specifically called out evaporative demand. And um, prior to this, we didn't really uh, uh, treat evaporative demand uh, in a way 
that was included in a lot of uh, our, our work uh, in terms of looking at uh, excess evaporative demand. Even if you have, for example, average precipitation, we have higher than average evaporative demand. And so our runoff efficiencies are a lot lower than what they used to be. It just wasn't uh, you know, used a lot. Um, so that really got us started and, and um, really spurred us to where we are today is this, uh, the, the NIDAS Reauthorization Act, the, the California and Nevada dues, and um, this whole uh, new way of, of doing things in the cloud. Um, so a, a central theme for all this was that one size doesn't fit all uh, in terms of uh, drought mapping. And that place-based assessments of drought are, are really critical. And um, this term drought due diligence, how do we, how do we figure out uh, impacts? And if the impacts are truly caused by drought, or maybe those impacts are due to lowering water levels because somebody's got a big irrigation well next to you and your spring dried up, uh, or is it the drought? How do you separate out these impacts? And also multi uh, time scales of, of drought, where you can have different signs of drought, opposite signs of drought happening at the same place at the same time. Um, so this really got uh, folks' attention, um, and and also how the legal structure uh, affects drought impacts. And this was a, a, a in 2015. Um, uh, uh, a webinar that Jason King, the Nevada State Engineer at the time, uh, held and was talking about just this thing. Um, I will say that, you know, back then the common limitation in conducting, and still to this day, uh, conducting the place-based drought due diligence is, is really related to a, a big data problem. So this uh, multiple timescales of drought, so this was 2015, uh, a 90-day SPEI ending basically the end of the water year, uh, and then the U.S. Drought Monitor. And um, here in Western Nevada, where where we're at, you can see that we had uh, much higher uh, uh, than normal um, precipitation, uh, lower evaporative demand, uh, because we had a really wet wet period. Um, it was cool and it was wet. Um, and you know the Drought Monitor showed basically the opposite. And the BLM was using the drought monitor for uh, grazing permits at that time. Now, um, this is what it looks it looked like from Landsat's perspective, using the full Landsat archive to calculate a percent difference from average for basically the growing season. This is Lovelock, Nevada, Western Nevada, in in that area where SPEI was was uh, uh, quite high. Now, you can see all the red areas, there was no water in the river to irrigate, um, and so these folks in the Lovelock Irrigation District didn't get a single irrigation. Now, the range was doing great. We had knee-high grasses, um, but the BLM at the time uh, revoked all grazing permits, um, and that caught uh, a lot of people off guard. They were using the U.S. Drought Monitor map to make the decision. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of forage out there. And so the ranchers uh, contacted their uh, congressional representative, Mark Amaday, uh, for this district, um, who is, uh, I think, just got uh, reelected. And, um, you know, basically said, look, uh, this, is, this is not right. Um, there's lots of grasses out there. Um, we need to do something about it. We need to use best available science. Uh, best available maps to make these decisions, um, basically drug in the head of the BLM and Forest Service into DRI. Um, I gave a presentation on just this. The BLM had already been funding us to use best available science and to get this technology into their hands. And so we were, we were well ahead of this curve. Um, it just hadn't really taken on yet, um, taken hold rather. So this is a modus land surface temperature difference from average for that period uh, that was made in climbing engine. Um, and you can see the cooler surface temperatures here with these red patches, the higher than average surface temperature. These are the irrigated lands. Uh, the reason why it looks the way it does is because with uh, evapotranspiration, uh, the higher the evapotranspiration, the cooler the surface. Um, evaporation and transpiration consumes energy, and so therefore the surface temperature cools. 
And so when you have anomalously low soil moisture or ET, uh, you get anomalously higher uh, surface temperature. And so you can clearly see uh, what's happening here. Um, and this is part of this hypothesis testing that I keep going back to. It's like, wow, look at what this map shows. There's so many cool features in here. And in fact, even in these small irrigated areas, there's a big contrast. Um, this is 100% surface water, no supplemental groundwater. This is Fallon. Uh, they were short uh, because of the reservoirs, but not too short. Um, and then these folks in Mason and Smith Valley and Carson Valley, they have supplemental groundwater. And so when they don't have enough surface water, they pump groundwater. Um, but there's still some shortage. But you can see that the surface temperature anomaly isn't quite as high as these other places that are more surface water reliant. So this is that, that legal structure, how legal structures and water rights uh, really uh, change the way um, drought impacts folks, especially for agriculture. So the big data problem, this, this uh, article really resonated with me um, in the sense that, uh, you know, we've been trying to develop toolkits that everybody can use. Um, and this quote from this article, if the data can't work together, the scientists can't either. And this question and issue around data interoperability uh, and how to best do that and follow fair data principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, um, where we need to really combine multi-source earth observations with climate data sets uh, and not have to like try to go remap it all to the same grid and deal with all these net CDF files or czar files um, on our own. We, we need a system that basically can do this for us so we don't endlessly you know, need to process and download uh, data. You know, we're all natural resource type folks, uh, not uh, software developers per se. And we need to do what we do best um, and not spend all our time coding. Um, so, uh, you know, innovations in tech got us into the big data problem. We have lots of data out there and we really need an evolution in tech to get us out. And so that's where we've been focusing is developing uh, toolkits um, that, that can help us get out of this. Um, so fair data principles, I touched on it just a, a, a little bit, but basically, you know, we really do need to combine earth observation, satellite earth observation data with climate data to start to address these questions of, well, is it the drought or is it grazing uh, that's impacting uh, rangelands? Well, how do we do that? Well, we gotta, we gotta mash together uh, lots of different data sets um, that all have different temporal resolutions, grid sizes, projections, uh, data types. Um, and so, you know, coming up with a, a solution that can deal with this was, was really a monumental uh, challenge. And um, I feel like we finally uh, started to get there with these new platforms out there like the Microsoft's Planetary Computer, uh, Google Earth Engine, and, and a few others. So um, we've been using Google Earth Engine, and um, I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. But basically, uh, the whole uh, concept is, um, is, is really bringing our algorithms to the data that live in the cloud instead of downloading massive amounts of data to our local servers, whether it's a regional climate center um, or a state water agency um, or a university. Um, we just can't handle uh, all these massive data archives sitting on servers and then having developers, you know, uh, write uh, code to process those data, again, on local servers, um, and then maintain all that data and then operationally ingest every single day um, with lots of different uh, data sets. So it's really a paradigm shift. We're, we're taking our algorithms to the data. Um, and, and allowing the big data companies to operationally update and ingest um, uh, these data sets so, so we don't have to. Now, we wanted to make some no-code solutions uh, to be able to do a lot of this processing rather than having the code in, in JavaScript or Python using the Google Earth Engine application programming interface. And, and that's really the challenge, you know, AWS, sure, they have the whole Landsat archive, they have Sentinel, they have a lot of different climate data sets now. Same with Microsoft's planetary computer, but you have to go code in their API and they don't have a lot of intrinsic functions like 
send slope, man kindle trend test, anomalies, percentiles, zonal statistics. You have to code that stuff up yourself. Whereas in Google Earth Engine, you have, you have a lot of intrinsic functions that are already pre-built and um, that's really nice. But we wanted to take it a step further so that you don't have to code in their APIs. So with Google Earth Engine, it is the world's largest archive of open earth observation uh, or open earth data, as they say. There's, there's 700 plus native data sets. Um, they have dedicated cloud computing, like I said, with all these algorithms that they have um, uh, pre-configured and written. Um, and then also we have uh, open access uh, to commercial data and models as well. So, um, for example, Planet, Planet Labs, um, or uh, maybe you have your own stack of uh, geotiffs that you want to load into a Google bucket. Uh, well, you can connect Google Earth Engine with a Google bucket and be able to read in those files and utilize a massively parallel cloud computing platform in Earth Engine. Now, Earth Engine does this so fast because they break up the pixels into 256 by 256 pixel chunks or blocks, and then they parallelize. They, they send those 256 by 256 blocks out, out to uh, lots of processors simultaneously, so you don't have to worry about the parallelization either. So a lot of benefits there. Now, uh, in terms of us developing uh, an app that sits on top of Earth Engine, we started this in, in 2014 with this concept uh, with a grant from Google Earth Engine. Um, we got a couple hundred thousand dollars to basically teach them on what was important to the climate community, uh, the, the land management, water management communities, and also test out this, this idea of can we build a front end, essentially a no-code solution for Earth Engine. And we were successful. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, of course, but uh, it, was, it was successful. And, and since then, it's been supported by NOAA and, and NIDUS. Uh, uh, and, and BLM and, and a few others as well. Um, and it really is a good public-private partnership story where Google started us, uh, the federal and state and, and local agencies have been funding us uh, since um, to keep this thing alive. Now, we got a lot of interest from the private sectors, uh, or the private sector, several different companies wanted to start purchasing data from us and start uh, accessing APIs. Um, and you know, universities don't know how to sell data. So um, we started a company and did a technology transfer to the company in 2020 um, and partnered with Google Cloud um, to really meet the request of the private sector. And uh, all in all, you know, we're, we're here to help deliver and develop tech and geospatial data for actionable insights. Um, okay, so um, this is the homepage, climateengine.com. And a lot of people have gotten confused since um, we revamped um, Climate Engine homepage. Um, it's like, well, where's the app? Where's the research app? It's still, it's still there. It's up in the upper right there. You click on that link, uh, and you can get to the research app. It is free. Um, you do have to uh, check the box. I'll, I'll go through that here in a little bit uh, on the terms and conditions, um, basically saying that you won't sue us or sell data. Uh, it is for non-commercial uses. Um, so here's just a little uh, preview of some of the things that you can do. Um, so we have a lot of different data sets, climate and hydrology and remote sensing data sets. Here I'm making a long-term drought blend. Uh, it's similar to the CPC drought blend. Um, and this is live uh, in terms of the fact that I didn't speed up the video. Um, you, you can make a map. For a particular period, uh, you can uh, make a time series, uh, drop a marker, uh, and get a time series for the coincident uh, four kilometer, in this case, cell that that marker uh, touched. And um, you can also, uh, for example, uh, bring in um, the US drought monitor and look at uh, the, the raster US drought monitor, uh, but then be able to apply our common set of functions, uh, statistical functions across uh, the, the US drought monitor, like make a trend in the rasterized US drought monitor for um, March through April, um, and then uh, filter by statistical significance using the Mankindle trend test. So we have all these common uh, 
functions that you can apply to any of the raster data sets that live in climate engine so that's what's really cool about this is that um, we have a, a a suite of calculations that can be applied across any data sets we also have forecasts this is the downscaled cfs uh, gridmet uh, 28 day forecast and then we can make percent of average having the forecast is great but let's use a climatology that's harmonized with the forecast to look at uh, the forecast percentiles, for example. So this is all great. Um, we uh, started getting questions about, well, I want to get time series for 200 points or 200 polygons, or I want to batch download maps. How do we do that? So that's where we started to develop the API and also help users not have to code an Earth Engine basically take all this code in the javascript api shown on the left and collapse this all down into a simple api call uh, that you can uh, execute either at the the browser or uh, as a curl command so that's where we started to work with uh, with noah and nidus um, we have a whole suite of different uh, api endpoints that we're going to go through here in a little bit um, and, and show you how to use these endpoints to be able to uh, crunch data, export the results to a Google bucket. Um, we have uh, several uh, tutorials on how to do this, and it's not just gridded climate, uh, it's also uh, a lot of satellite data like, like Landsat and MODIS. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna uh, uh, spend too much time here um, and, and steal others' thunder. Uh, all right, okay. Cool. Yeah, so as I said, um, our first real big test uh, on, on using the API operationally was working with Steve and Serrari and the, and the drought.gov folks. So they are now operationally hitting the API uh, multiple times a day uh, to make these maps. Um, they basically make the GeoTIFF, export it uh, into a Google bucket, they pick it up and then uh, uh, make raster tile caches from those geotiffs and then they display those raster tile caches on drought.gov and, and this all gets updated every single night so really cool they're also uh stashing their own geotiffs a cloud optimized geotiffs in a google bucket that then we pick up and use in earth engine like in climb grid and aces and, and a lot of uh, the noaa specific data sets that are not in the google earth engine data catalog but custom <clears throat> So with respect to research to, to decisions and how folks are using this, um, here's an example that I really uh, find fascinating in, in how fast we can explore and, and look at impacts, for example, uh, uh, from riparian restoration. So we're gonna compute uh, Landsat NDVI for June, July, August, um, and look at the trend in uh, mean or median June, July, August uh, over 1984 through 2022. So every year we're going to compute the median NDVI for June, July, August, and then compute the send slope per pixel. So this is a this is a trend map in Greenus or NDVI, and this particular stretch of of river is called Susie Creek. Um, uh, beavers came back after they started to do restoration in the in the late 90s. The beavers really started to take hold in the 2000s. And um, so, all right, well, let's look and see what this little patch looks like through time. Um, so you can you can see uh, the big increase in greenness here uh, at around 2010, um, but it really, uh, there was an upward tick here around 2005 from basically rock bottom to starting with trending upwards. And it's like, okay, well, how does the climate compare to this? So that I just, pulled out the prism precipitation for the water year. Uh, and even though, you know, we got a little wet there, uh, right when we started to get green, we still had some significant droughts past that period. And we were greener than we ever were before, even during some new droughts that came, came around after the restoration. Uh, here's another one. Um, so we have the rangeland analysis platform uh, data sets, 30 meter resolution, uh, herbaceous cover. Um, 
well, we have vegetation cover percent, uh, and then uh, break it out by the types of vegetation. Um, it's a it's a project that uh, University of Montana started with Brady Aldred. Now he works at Google Earth Engine, um, but this is the total production in in pounds per acre of uh, of herbaceous production. Uh, we just spatially averaged all the data to that particular grazing allotment. Now let's look and see how it compares to SPEI for the water year, basically a 12-month SPEI ending in um, September. And uh, being able to plot two variables on the same graph, and again, this is real time, you can be like, oh, okay, that's why production is going up or down. Um, it's not solely due to pulling cows off the range or putting cows off the, on the range. Um, it's related to climate, and I can quickly go figure that out. And then also from there, develop models and, and develop regressions and, and start to look at, uh, you know, trends in residuals or, you know, per year residuals. And okay, well, take, taking into the account these exogenous factors. Um, USGS is also using Climate Engine to uh, be able to prove restoration success uh, by pulling out uh, water year precipitation, and NDVI prior to the restoration and then post restoration and being able to say statistically speaking, okay, these black data points post restoration, they're above the prediction intervals, um, the 95% prediction intervals, I can be confident that this has happened. You know, restoration was successful. We have more resilience, more resistance. Um, so this is a big deal. And we have this functionality in climate engine to do these regressions on the fly. BLM is using this uh, to look at, at what we were talking about before in the sense of separating out climate versus of grazing impacts. This is a, a control spring area. You can see the, the high correlation between NDVI and precipitation. And in the spring area under, under uh, consideration here for this, this environmental assessment, um, NDVI is going down uh, and, and, the, and the precipitation really hasn't changed all that much. So this ended up in an environmental assessment um, litigation. A grazing uh, permit specialist uh, in Nevada put together these slides right here. This was an area of interest where, you know, cows were impacting the riparian zone. He made a Landsat percent difference from average map for a wet year. Um, and, and you can see all the above average uh, greenness here, but you still have below average greenness in the riparian zone where he suspected the cows were impacting. Um, the, the vegetation, and so he dug into this a little bit more, and it's like, oh, okay, this is what the NDVI is doing for that little polygon that he drew, um, and then this is what the precipitation has been doing for that area, um, and water your precipitation, and, um, you know, you can see that uh, even though we got some wet years, uh, you know, the NDVI just has not come back. Tribal nations, um, we've been working quite a bit with the Navajo Nation, I've developed a spinoff tool for them called DSET to really help them uh, better characterize drought and impacts over the, over the Navajo Nation. These links here, I did share this slide deck in the chat, so check it out. Um, they have a lot of really cool uh, links um, to YouTube videos on how to use the tool and also a really nice detailed manual. State agency use. Um, we are uh, collaborating with many state water agencies in particular. Uh, this is the, the uh, Idaho Department of Water Resources, a training that we did in person, um, and a, a nice quote from Bill Kramer about how uh, Climate Engine basically saved a, a ton of time for their basin engineers to deal with uh, some water rights disputes uh, over, was it the drought or was it my neighbor uh, taking all the water? It was used uh, in Nevada for a state of Nevada water rights ruling in a forfeiture analysis. Um, the state's not going after people and forfeiting their rights. Um, rather, uh, this particular water right uh, holder was uh, uh, um, applied to expand his acreage. Uh, his neighbor protested, uh, saying that there wasn't water, enough water in the basin. And on top of that, he hadn't been putting his water to beneficial use for more than five years in a row in Nevada, you have a use it or lose it uh, policy. If you don't use your water rights for five years, 
in a row consecutively, they can be forfeited. Um, so uh, the protestants uh, consultant uh, used Climate Engine to show just that, that the applicant was not using their water rights for five consecutive years in a row, and Climate Engine ended up in the ruling. Um, BLM and some legal uh, uh, issues, um, some litigation is actually ongoing. Needle Point Spring near Great Basin National Park, this issue of uh, farmers uh, irrigating, drawing down the water table, dried up a spring, um, and uh, the, the farmers were saying it was the drought, and BLM was saying it was the pumping, and you can see the increase in pumping here and the decline in the spring water level. Uh, for the same amount of water year precipitation, uh, <clears throat> uh, post-pumping, you can see is a lot less NDVI than pre-pumping, uh, NDVI. Now, uh, basically, this this clearly shows that it wasn't uh, climate related; it was it was pumping related. In California, we're working with the uh, California Department of Water Resources as well as the State Water Control Board to help them for uh, basically monitoring irrigated lands and and impacts uh, due to drought and how uh, crop. Uh, type and crop production changes over time. So this is an uh, NDVI anomaly map uh, for, I wanna say it was 2021. Um, so you can really start to zoom in. Um, this is uh, an orchard of some sort. Um, you can see this big uh, blue, uh, greener, higher production than average in, in 2021. Um, and this is what it looks like in time. So you can go back and look at this full rich history of NDVI over the growing season and you can see that they weren't really uh, productive and then all of a sudden they started to, uh, this orchard really started to mature as all orchards do um, and, and has been leveling off here. Um, so in summary, uh, climate engine and platforms like it really provide new and uh, advanced and I'd say exciting opportunities to assess place-based uh, operational uh, insights and, and really this recent explosion of earth observation data um, integrated um, into operations um, is, is really just the beginning. And uh, Steve Ansari put it really well uh, that it's an innovative cloud first tool and has a lot of uh, tremendous potential. And there's lots of, well, there are, I, I shouldn't say there's lots of tools, but there are other tools out there like this, um, but, but nothing that integrates so much uh, information. Okay, uh, well, I will just say one more thing before I uh, jump into a little demo, is that adequate support for adoption of new tech uh, like this is really key, especially with IT and admin support. So, you know, we've seen a lot of pushback from IT and admin are like, oh, well, you can't use this app. It's it's using stuff in the cloud. You know, can we, can we, can we use stuff in the cloud? How do we deal with this um, from a security perspective, the data doesn't reside locally. Um, th there are issues to deal with. Um, so just want to uh, throw that out there that we really need to cross this, the, the, these barriers and these bridges. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a, a little demo here, but uh, um, I'll take some questions if we have any so far. Yeah, nobody's uh, typing any questions in the chat, but please feel free to do so. Okay, so um, when you first go to Climate Engine, um, there's an option uh, to do a tour. Um, and the mapping and graphing tours are, are really good um, uh, to, to go through basically. Um, gives you a really nice sense of what the capabilities are right off the start. Um, so uh, I, I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, before you can access the app, you have to register. And um, you can sign in with your Google account um, or uh, you can put in your email and uh, password 
you do have to accept the terms of use and basically the terms, like I said before, are around uh, not selling data from the app. Um, it's it's non-commercial um, and uh, please don't sue us. <laughs> um, th that's pretty much the summary of the terms. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully those terms won't um, scare you away uh, or, you know, don't, don't cause problems within your agency to, to be able to use the app. But they're, they're basic terms that we all just check through all the time when we see things like this pop up. Um, so uh, there are uh, uh, a couple uh, main, uh, let me get back in the slideshow. There are some main features of the app that are really important to note. Um, basically, we have a make map tab and a make graph tab. Um, so the menu options are different, whether you want to make a map or a time series. Um, and then once you make a map or a time series, you can see the map or time series uh, by clicking on these tabs up at, the, up at the top here and also see the data. So uh, just a printout of the, of the time series. Um, you can change colors, uh, legend, you know, color ramps, uh, set, scales, maxes and mins, um, thresholding in terms of masking. And then most importantly, you can download the data. So I'm gonna give a little demo of this here in a sec. Um, you can click on this get link tab and it will provide a link um, to the map that you just created or the time series and recreate it. So you can share it with a friend um, and then get help and get info on the data sets here down at the bottom. For the get time series, um, like I said before, uh, this is kind of how you navigate between the map and the figure um, or the, the time series figure. So sometimes you may not see your figure that you just made. Um, uh, you just got to click on the tab and it'll, it'll come up. You can download the time series as an Excel file or a CSV. Um, or uh, download the PNG or JPEG of, of the graph. Uh, and then you can um, uh, drop this down and you have multiple options on how you want to get that time series, whether it's a point, a polygon uh, that you can draw or, or a shape file that you upload. So I'm gonna show a couple of examples of this here um, now. All right. So uh, I'm gonna go live here and do some examples. So multiple time scales of drought, uh, drought indices for different climatologies and different standardization approaches. Um, this is something that Steve asked us to add. Um, you know, what if you use a gamma versus something else uh, or log logistic for SPI versus a non-parametric type of uh, standardization and then different climatology periods. You know, there's a recent nature paper saying, hey, you know, we, sh we should only use the last 30 year period uh, for say SPEI, because we don't expect the temperature to go down. It's high now. We shouldn't be using the full 1895 to current record. Uh, but at the same time, you know, plants uh, respond uh, to this uh, increase in temperature. And so, you know, um, it, it. I guess I would just say that it's all about what you're trying to, uh, you know, you know, what kind of questions you have and, and what kind of answers you're trying to get, whether you use the full time scale or this last 30 year period, uh, given that, you know, we don't expect temperatures to go down. So, so you know, uh, an anomaly temperature map uh, or, you know, a drought index that uses temperature, um, you know, let's use the last 30 year period instead of the full record um, is really the argument that got posed in that nature paper. Uh, Justin, um, I'm just going to interrupt because um, I am only seeing still your presentation. Were you were you wanting to be live? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go live right now. Just wanted to be sure there wasn't a hiccup. Yeah, there. you bet. Surface temperature anomaly in relation to to um, ET and drought in the season and download map. Okay, so let me let me go live here. So um, all right, so. Uh, under the type, we have um, just these general categories, climate and hydrology, remote sensing environment, hazards, and then forecasts. And under climate and hydrology, uh, thanks much to the team, um, we just reorganized a lot of this into global data sets uh, versus North America, CONUS, 
um, just to, and then alphabet, alphabetical from there. Um, so uh, I'm going to go with uh, grid met drought. <clears throat> These are pre-computed pentad uh, drought indices that we have, and then the short-term blend and long-term blend that I talked about before. So uh, I'm going to do the latest pentad uh, and look at the short-term blend. And uh, this is pulling up the data on the fly. Um, it is a pre-compute. Well, actually, we're computing the short-term blend using this ingredients, <laughs> these different ingredients um, uh, that we can actually uh, check out here in terms of uh, metrics. Uh, actually, yeah, here it is. So we provide all the information for each of the data sets under the uh, Git info. And um, so this is basically the ingredients of uh, the short-term blend that we've come up with. It Again, it follows very uh, closely the CPC approach. Um, we do have some different um, ingredients in here uh, that are not in CPC, um, but you can see the long-term here versus the short-term. Basically, the long-term has some more uh, longer term SPI uh, rather than just the 30 day and the 90 day. And then we have these multiplication factors. Now the CPC group, you know, they, they have different factors for different parts in the country, the West versus East. We have one, um, you know, this can be optimized obviously, but this is a good start. We've compared it to a lot of uh, different impacts, uh, both short term and long term that we've uh, explored using satellite data. All right. Um, okay, so that's that. Let me show you how to share a link. So you get get a link. Um, there's a long link that you can uh, produce that has all the map parameters uh, in it, so you can see exactly what's going on. Um, or the short link. I use the short link mostly, um, and I'm going to copy and paste this into a new window so that I can toggle back and forth. Now I'm going to do a long-term blend. Make that see what that looks like. Oh, server error, never fails. Um, okay. All right, uh, let me do this again. Short-term blend. Link, control A, C. I did something weird. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to make the long term blend. I think what happened was I, I uh, copied and pasted the long link in there instead of the short, and I messed it up. All right, so you can see here, let's see this. This tile is going to be coming back. All right, yeah. So you can, you know, why that uh, it's a little different there in terms of the map placement, but you can see just generally, you know, you got the long term shows California, <clears throat> Central Plains, uh, and then the short term not so bad. You see the the heavy monsoon that we got uh, down in the southwest. Um, okay, so that's just a little example of how uh, uh, to generally use uh, a couple of the features here. Um, make graph and pull out a time series uh, for the long-term blend. So the default is just to drop a marker down. We have some, uh, some pre-computed or some pre-specified ranges here. I'm just going to change this to 2000. And then it's going to pull all the data that exists uh, for that specified period. Um, and uh, hopefully pull it out and plot it here in uh, just a sec. There you go. Um, so this is the long term. Um, and let's look and test out the two variable analysis option. So let's bring in now the short term blend. Uh, I'll go back to grid met drought, 
these pre-computed pen tabs, uh, short-term wind, and then let's get my time right, 2022, change this to 2000, uh, and then it's gonna plot the short-term blend with the long-term blend so we can see how these things are different in time. And uh, what you'll see is that, you know, the long-term blend is kind of a smoothed uh, representation of the short-term. Uh, but it's really neat to be able to, to pull these um, uh, two things out. Now that is kind of interesting. So this is what I call exploring on the fly, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this where um, the the short term blend doesn't fall on top of the long term blend as as much. Um, so you know, you start to scratch your head and go, hmm, I wonder wonder what's going on here. Um, we have the, the raw data that you can get here, uh, and then as far as download, you can download the CSV right here. Uh, uh, let's see, in terms of downloading uh, the map, uh, you select a region, uh, and then you can you know, drag the box around, uh, you can put in a bounding uh, box coordinates, and then name it, uh, and then download map layer. So it's going to uh, clip the image and then uh, give you this link that you go and uh, uh, it will start downloading the zip file of the GeoTIFF. So that's kind of handy. Um, all right, so let's go back to uh, the different standardization approaches. Um, and I know that I'm getting uh, short on time. Um, so. I will just do this one more thing and then pass it over uh, to set set up Jody and Kristen. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, let's let's use uh, grid net, precipitation, standardized index. We have non-parametric gamma log logistic. The non-parametric is a two-key two plotting position approach. Gamma is commonly used for SPI. Um, I'll do the 90-day uh, and this latest climatology period we have. All right, so that's that. And the tile just came back. Uh, now we're gonna, I'm gonna get that link, control A, C, put it here so I can reference it, check out how it's different, and then use the Tukey for the same thing. Um, there's been several papers on the use of a standardized or non-parametric index or non-parametric type of approach so you can compare indices to one another more easily. Um, so there's uh, gamma versus Tukey same climate. So again, uh, hypothesis testing, um, checking stuff out, super useful. One last uh, thing, and then I promise I will pass it over, uh, is the shapefile upload. It's something that we just um, put together. Uh, so you can uh, upload a shapefile, uh, pick the column or the attribute field that you want to use. In this particular case, it's its name, uh, Clayton Valley. It is the only lithium mine in the country. So there's a lot of interest around uh, this particular area in terms of water budgets. Um, so we're gonna pull out the precipitation, the daily data. Uh, in fact, let's, let's pull out uh, one variable, summary time series, water year total every year, year after year for the full period of record. So, and it's gonna spatially average all the data uh, to the polygon total over the day range, water year. So water year total, year after year, spatially averaged to the polygon. So there you go. 
uh, just did all that zonal statistics and reductions on the fly, and then um, I can download the, the Excel file. All right, I think that's enough. Uh, sorry for going way long, uh, team, but I, I wanted to get to that. <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, and we still don't have any questions. I think people are kind of awestruck, um, but and, and maybe really looking forward to this next part. So I'm gonna go ahead and change presenter. So Jody, you should now be getting an invitation to share your screen. Great. Can you see it? Looks great. Okay, so now that Justin's got you all excited about the the data and uh, different things you can do, um, you know, you're thinking, okay, I want to I want to get started, um, and maybe you want to build something, or maybe you want to pull down the data to start analyzing it. And uh, the the GUI is great, um, but sometimes you just want the data. And so what we have built is an API so that you can programmatically connect. Um, and so maybe you want to pull down some rasters to put in your website. Uh, maybe you want to uh, pull down the time series and build a chart in your website, or maybe just to pull that data down and kind of put it in a CSV file and start and start analyzing it. So we have built this API, and I'm just going to show this chart really quick because it is a really good reminder of of what an API is and you know what it does. And so you are using your computer, you're making an API call to our a API, which is an interface. And it's going to hide, it's going to abstract everything that you want to do with Earth Engine. And it's going to make it so that you can do these queries with, you know, maybe five lines of code. So it's going to query Earth Engine. And this is for simplicity's sake. Sometimes there's a lot more going on than just that. Earth Engine is going to return the data. We may manipulate the data. And then we're going to return uh, your call with data. And that's normally in JSON, or if it's a raster, it could be sent to uh, a storage area on the cloud. Uh, it could be a map ID, which will create a map layer uh, that you can use in a browser. Uh, or it could just be um, a CSV that you could download. And so the, the here's the components of a, an endpoint. And so the API, it's just a, it's just a URL. So the root is going to be geodata.dri.edu. You'll have a resource path. So that's going to define what you want. In this example, you're pulling down time series, and you just want the raw data for points. And then you need to provide us different parameters. Um, and this is shortened, uh, so it fits on the screen. But it's going to be your data set, uh, the variable you'd like to uh, query, um, and maybe kind of the statistics you want to run on it, start date, end date. And so our API has several categories. Um, we have the rasters, and so that's exporting exporting it to a bucket. Um, we also have the map ID, which is something you can use for our mapping layer and leaflet. We have time series, it's raw, yearly seasonal values, regression, uh, the zonal statistics that Justin was showing, uh, the pixel counts of drought, drought other things and then probabilities. And so this kind of gives you the t uh, an idea of the type of data that you're going to get back from us. So how do you interact with the API? Um, we have a Swagger UI, and so it's called uh, Interactive Documentation. And so it is going to, uh, it's set up so that you can start making these calls. And it's going to uh, have some examples. Um, and you can just try it out and right off the bat, it will do some calls for you. You can do it programmatically, which uh, maybe once you get more comfortable, then you can start, you know, doing polling data every night like Noah, um, or you can do a curl command. And so I will be going over the Swagger UI as kind of a place to get started. And then um, Kristen is going to kind of go through these collab notebooks and kind of show you how to get started with doing it, with uh, programming it. So there are two kind of main pieces kind of to get started with it. And one is going to be the documentation. So it is an API. And so it's essentially a set of definitions on how to interact uh, with the API. And so we need to know what those definitions are. We need to know that resource path. We need to know what parameters. 
And so that is going to show you all those, uh, the parameters, the data sets and the variables that are available. And in addition, we have uh, getting started and tutorials. And after this, we will upload Kristen's um, CoLab notebook to that tutorial section. And then we have this Swagger UI, um, and that is also at geodata.dri.edu slash docs. So let me go escape out of here so we can get to those pages. So here we have the documentation. And then here is a Swagger page. So we're just going to take a look at this documentation. So we have here under REST API, we have those different categories of endpoints. We have the rasters or maps, time series, zonal statistics, probabilities. So let's just go ahead and take a look at one of those. And we can see there's all different sorts of resource paths. And we'll just look at this time series native points. Click on that. So this is going to return the raw data for the points. So each one should have a little description of what it does. And then it's going to define all these parameters. And it's going to tell you, are they required or are they not? And then it should have some examples. And so to make a basic time series call, you need to know the data set, the variable, start date, end date, and the area reducer. And then down here, um, we have lots of different data sets. And this is going to provide that parameter name for all the different data sets. And then each data set also has a lot of different variables. So we'll just take a look at, a, we'll try Landsat. So this is the different variables under each data set. And this is what you would need to copy to put in as the data uh, variable parameter. And then down here is our, our tutorials that are available. So there's a lot of information in here. Um, so we have, like I said, a good place to start is the Swagger documentation. And to get started on that, um, because there is uh, some costs associated with uh, running Climate Engine, we don't want just anybody using it. So there, you do have to, to authorize using a, a JWT token, so an API key. And so you would need to hit this button. Uh, I've already entered in the key. Um, and then you just hit the button there to, to verify. And then that's going to authorize you to use the Swagger page. Um, and right now we have one to uh, for everyone to play around with. Uh, eventually you would need to email us directly if you wanted to get one that was longer term. So once you have authorized onto the Swagger page, you can now access all the different endpoints. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. Uh, they're also segregated into different categories. Those the categories of raster, time series. But kind of a good place to get started is here under home. So maybe the first thing you want to do is say, does my token even work? So you can go over there. There's um, execute. And it's just going to return this JSON uh, result. And it's going to say, your key works. And so this is a good time to kind of orientate you with Swagger and show you what it's going to, um, what types of things it's going to send back to you. So here is a curl command. Uh, I said you could put the curl command directly in your terminal to get results back. So it's going to build that for you. So you could copy and paste that and put it into your terminal. It's going to show you the request URL that you could put into your, um, your Python script. And then here's what it's returning. You can download it off of this page if you would like. And then here's the status code showing you whether it was uh, successful or not. So now we know we have a, a token that works. Um, we can try it out again, uh, see when it, it's expiring. This one's just a short one that's going to last for a month. So now we know we have a, a key that works and it's going to 
be good for a month. So now we can go down to these different categories and I'm just gonna go to the time series native points as an example. And down here, we have all of those parameters and we have pre-filled out all the ones that are required. So this is just a simple Landsat in DVI example for a short period of time. And then here is our um, points. So you can actually add uh, a various, you can add multiple points for simplicity's sake, it's just one point. So I'm going to hit execute. It's built that curl command, it's built the request URL. And then down here, I can see that it's giving me uh, a time series for that point for NDVI. So this is uh, the Swagger page, like I said, it's just a, it's a good place to get started to kind of get an idea of, of maybe your first step in interacting with the, the API. However, um, you will probably want to, uh, many of you will want to you know, start building something and um, uh, that would be, Kristen's next section should be kind of a good way to get started with some of the py uh, Python scripts. So I am going to go ahead and hand it over to her unless there are any questions. Yeah, we do actually have a couple of questions. And so let's okay. start, I'll just go ahead and, and read through them. Although it looks like you're going to let the quick. Okay, first question: Is there a limit to the size of the data download in one request? Yes, it's a post request, so there is a limit. Um, there's also um, a computing limit on Earth Engine. So Earth Engine has a five-minute timeout. So if it can't do it within five minutes, you you will be getting an error message. So if you try to pull down. The entire US for however long, the full length of Landsat, it will probably time out. Okay, great. Next question. Instead of upload, uh, instead of using upload of shapefile, can you specify a hosted WMS layer either in S3, ArcGIS online, or other hosted WMS server to compute zonal stats? Boy, that made no sense to me, but I bet it made sense uh. to you. Uh, no, uh, not currently. Not not currently. But that's a good that's a good suggestion. Yeah, thanks, Christina, for that. All right, John um, Nielsen Gammon has a question in the app. How do I turn off the background map? So if you go to the top menu bar uh, under Map, there's a drop down Map Options. You can change your base map. Right now, the default's hybrid. Uh, but you can change it to, I don't know, there's a half dozen or so options. Yeah, but none of them are none. None of them are none, so you want just white. Yeah, so that the color is the pure color from the scale rather than something that's sort of tinted based on what's on the background. Okay, so there's a transparency bar on the right. See that little transparency bar under the, the zoom in and out? Okay, got it, thank you. Yep. Yeah, perfect. perfect. That transparency okay. bar is super handy. Yep, I've used it for my limited use, and it's just lovely. It's just a great way to highlight. Okay, we've got one more question from Keith. I requested a token back in August and was told they weren't onboarding new users at that time. Is Are you now? Yeah, yeah. Um, we need to kick the tires on this and we would love to have feedback. Part of the issue is uh, egress. So we've set up a Google Cloud bucket for you, this group right here to write data to. Uh, now, when you download data from that bucket, we get charged for egress, 12 cents a gig. So, but I'm willing to take that risk uh, to help and and to have you all kick the tires but there is a cost with cloud and um you know I, i'm not i'm not too worried about it <laughs> just as long as we don't start exporting and down and egressing terabytes okay you'll be able to monitor that so you can also let us know yeah and the, and the token the experiment's for going. expires so. in one month okay 
Christian. I think you're muted, Christian. <laughs> um, I, I just saying thank you, Jody and Justin, um, for all of the great background. I'm going to just continue building off of that. And so uh, the, I'm going to be presenting some base workflows. I know there's varying levels of expertise here. Um, so you can build on it, pick your favorite Python packages and your favorite editor moving forward. Um, I'm just going to present some workflows um, using Google, Google Colab. So this is going to allow us to uh, make all of our requests, create different maps, export TIFFs, CSVs, all um, within our browser. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, Google Colab is a free Jupyter Notebook environment that runs entirely on, in the cloud. On the left here, you can see kind of what it looks like. They have a lot of great documentation. Um, so they have a welcome to collaboratory um, notebook here that you can go through, see how to start setting up and see a lot of examples using it. Um, on the right, it shows you when you open Google Colab, it gives you different examples uh, or different areas you can go. So you can look at examples that have already been made. You can look at your recent documents. You can connect to your GitHub or your Google Drive where the notebooks are stored. Um, so just looking further, if you were getting started and you wanted to use the Climate Engine API and you're starting a new notebook, you would go uh, right here on the bottom. It's uh, gonna say new notebook. Otherwise, if you had a recent one that you've been working on, you could see I did had Climate Engine API examples um, for today here. You could just click and open that also. Um, and then I have links to the different examples here. So if you have the uh, slide deck, you can just click on them and that should take you to the Google uh, Collab notebooks um, for these examples. And I kind of want to just give a lay of land, all of the things that are really important moving forward using Google Colab. So we'll work from left to right. Um, first, you see you can add your name script here. Um, and that's how you're going to be able to search it within your Google Drive. Um, down here is upload files. So for these scripts, I pulled rasters for the entire United States. So I uploaded a shapefile for the US and it allowed me to use it within the code here. Um, moving over, we have these little buttons for adding both code snippets, which you can see in the green hashtag um, add code, uh, which is gonna be Python, and then adding text that allows you um, to, note, to do notation as you go through, um, create sections that you can um, go back to. A really great thing here is that all of the changes are saved. So just like using working in a Google Doc, um, you don't have to go file save. Um, it's going to regularly do that for you. Um, and then lastly, over here, um, something that's really great about Google Colab is your ability to share um, with others. Um, so for these documents, I went to share. I made the link open to the public. Um, and you can pick a viewer editor, um, just like all of the other um, Google products. And so next, I uh, just want to kind of show um, kind of the workflow that we're going to be going through. So we have some scripts here that are going to be in the Clodit Lab notebook. We're going to run those API requests um, like Jody talked about. And the requests are going to output TIFFs to the Google bucket here uh, that we have set up for the next month um, for you to play around with. And then you can also pull back in from the cloud storage to be able to make maps um, or do further analysis. Um, so some tips for the notebooks I saved today, make sure that you save as a copy in your drive so we're not all editing the same notebook. And then you're not gonna wanna make the um, scripts public because the API key, um, like Jody was talking before, uh, you can have a lot of download requests and we want to um, really keep it to this group working on that. Um, so I'll go to the demos. And while you're pulling that up, Kristen, you can uh, write to your own Google bucket. So if folks have their own Google bucket, you can write to that so that you can egress and you don't uh, 
and and we don't get charged for the egress you do <laughs> so and um, i'll point out in the script where you can do that cool awesome um so to orient you uh here we have a google collab script up we're connected to a runtime so it has a green check mark here um and it tells us uh how much we have left for storage and whatnot um, on the left here, I have table of contents. So when you're exploring this, I'm only going to look at a subset of these, but you can click and go to any of the sections um, and try them out. And then this little folder here, you can see I have the continental US shapefile along with some of our other exports um, that I've tested before here. So we'll be bringing the different data sets and we can see them in this folder. Um, so to start out, you're going to want to import or install all of your packages. Um, you press the little play button on the code section here. It gives me a nice check mark um, when it's done. I'm going to work through some of these. Um, so I have installations that have to do with working with the data, putting it in data frames, um, some mapping packages here. So this is where you can edit out um, for your favorite uh, packages moving forward. And then similarly to when we were working with the Swagger, uh, we have our root URL, so um, geodata.dra.edu. So we're going to set that. The headers is going to be my the authorization key. And so we'll run that. They're all very quick. And this is where you would change out your uh, bucket. So we have CE AASC NIDIS here. And so we're going to run that. Um, so that's kind of all of the prep um, to make a request uh, setting up there. Next, we're going to move into requesting the raster section. Um, so it has it here, but if I clicked on this, it would bring me um, back here also. Um, so what I have set up here is it's reading in that shape file from this uh, folder. And then it's gonna generate a box um, that's gonna have bounds. And it's gonna form up those bounds in a way that the API call and the endpoint understands. And so there's documentation for each um, different endpoint on, is it looking for a bounding box, a polygon coordinates, um, things like that. So it's going to bring that in and it's gonna print out this bounding box so we know what we're pulling um, for. And now I'm going to go to the exploring land surface um, temperature. So I have two different API example calls in this section. One is for anomalies and one is for percentiles. So we've set out all of our background. Now we wanna pick which endpoint out of that really long list uh, matches what we're trying to look for. So here I'm looking for a raster because I want to make a map. I want to export it. And specifically, I want to look at anomalies. And so um, on that documentation page that Jody went over, I would search for this one. Um, then I'm going to make the file name. What do I want it to export as? And then set up those parameters. Uh, so specifically, I want to pull the Modus Terra 8 day data set, the variable I want to look um look at is land surface temperature and so all of these options are outlined within the documentation so i don't have to guess um how, how do i format land surface temperature it's going to tell us right there what variables are the option and i can just copy and paste it um it gets going to ask for temporal statistics so mean median max um, minimum i picked mean the calculation I want to do, um, so there's three different anomaly calculations. Um, I picked anom. My start date is going to be January 1st of 2022. End date is July 31st, 2022. And then we have a start year and end year. So we're going to go 2000 to 2021. Um, the bounding box is going to pull that box that I set up before. It's going to pull the bucket name and the file name right here as the export path. So these are all of the parameters that I'm looking to make that API request. I'm going to play that cell. And then I'm actually going to make the request here. So it's going to put all those pieces together, the root URL, the endpoint, all of the parameters, the key, 
um, and it's going to tell us what its status is. Um, so you can see the little green arrow is going to run through and then it's done. It's already. And so what it's doing is it's making that request and it's going to send that raster for that bounding box um, to the bucket I told it. And so you have some examples here we can see because uh, it can take some time for the whole US. Um, so we can keep moving on with our example. So I just did the modus LST anom TIFF. So here it is, it'll tell you when it was created, its size, all of that. And so I'm gonna just quickly do the same thing with percentiles. So the only difference in making the map is I'm using a different endpoint and it's going to have a couple different parameters. Um, percentile step is a parameter, it just defaults um, so I didn't include it here. Um, and then we can run that also. And so it's gonna do the same thing. And so now you have your raster and your Google Cloud Storage bucket. Um, say we want to generate and export a map. So I'm gonna skip to this section uh, first here. So what we're gonna do is first get access to the Google Cloud Storage bucket. Um, so what we pretty much have to do is run this little section. It's going to have your project ID and it's going to have another pop up that asks you to confirm. Yes, this is my um, Gmail account that is associated. Uh, I want to connect to this. Um, so after that, we're all ready to go. We're going to download the file um, from the Google storage bucket. So I have my anom file name there. And I want to put it in my content folder and I want to name it modus LST anom. So I'm going to run that. It should be pretty quick. It's telling you that it's copying it from the Google bucket. And then you're going to see it here at the modus LST anom tiff. So if you already have it um, and you rerun it with the same name, it's going to just replace it. Next, I'm going to define the file path name. So I'm going to read it back into the um, Python script. I'm using some packages. And next, I'm going to look to generate my map. Um, so I put a pretty simple one together. Again, you can use your favorite packages to stylize and add different features. But I'm going to generate the map. I'm going to add a color bar, set the title. And we have the output here. Um, I'm also going to have the option to export so we can see it's going to pop up. There's a non PNG, which we can download directly to your computer from here. Same with the TIFF. Um, and these files go away when your runtime goes away. Um, so you'll want to make sure you download them when you do. And it's going to show the map here. Um, so this is. Uh, between that January and July 31st over that time period. So it's the difference from average. Yeah, you can really see the impact of the drought, uh, Texas up through Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, and then of course, Definitely. California, all the burn scars in California show up. Definitely, and you can play with the um, coloration, but it's going to be the same thing you're seeing in the app here. Slight differences might just be the color scale and you can tweak that. Um, so we're going to do the same thing here with the percentile. So I'm going to copy that to my files there. I'm going to set a new file path and I'm going to generate another map. And I will try to hurry because I do want to quickly do time series. Um, but so for the same time period, this is the temperature percentile from distribution of past observations. Um, it's going to look slightly different than the app because it's a continuous scale here, but you could tweak it to have the same um, colorations, but the trends are the same. Um, yeah, I'm going to quickly hop and then if we have time for questions. Uh, I just wanted to point out that um, there's a time series notebook here. So we're going to do the same 
kind of workflow of installing our packages, setting up all of our variables to be able to make the API request. Um, so I have single variable analysis and two variable analysis here. So we'll go to the single variable. Um, so our endpoint is gonna look a little different. We're doing time series native points and we set up these parameters. So I grabbed from the grid map drought, the long-term blend from 1980 to 2022. Um, I pulled coordinates uh, so that um, it was agricultural fields in California. I pulled a point from one of those that Justin showed earlier, and we're gonna do a mean reducer. So I'll run that and make the request. And it's gonna take a second. And uh, you can kind of see I have the output still here. So once the request comes through, um, we're gonna assign it to time series. We're gonna turn it into a data frame that we can print. And you can see here it has date, the long-term blend values, and you can also export it as a CSV to these files here. And then you can click to download locally. This is where it really gets great. If you say have a hundred areas, you can loop through them and create CSVs for all of the hundred areas. Um, with a loop there. Um, so that's still running. But hopefully it'll be soon. I don't think it will let me do the next one without it, even though I had it. Well, that's running, Kristen. There's a question uh, from Christina in the web app. I think, okay, I think Justin just responded to it, but is there an automatic citation generator? So for example, when we build a product, a set of text is generated based on what data are used to construct the result. Not super detailed. That's a good suggestion. And it's something that we're talking about doing is, uh, is providing a metadata file. Uh, so when you download the data, uh, metadata comes along with it. I mean, we do capture a lot of the stuff in the title. Uh, um, you know, the, the date range, if it's an anomaly or percentile, uh, the data set, that sort of stuff. So the, the basics are there in the title, but um, uh, a lot of the details of the metadata, like cell size and that sort of stuff isn't. Okay. Thank you. Um, so quickly, what we're going to do is we're going to filter out all non-available data. So that's the ones giving us the negative 9,999. We're going to format it so that it plots dates nicely along the end or on the x-axis. And then we're going to set the x values to date and then the y values or the long-term blend to value. And then we're going to generate this um, plot here, which looks just like this plot um, in the app. Um, so yeah, we have our long-term blend on the left, our dates, you can um, obviously update uh, the tick marks, you can have uh, more of the years written out. Um, yeah, so I think I'm at time, but there are there's an example in there, uh, kind of have Justin showed having two variables plotted of the long-term and short-term blends. Yeah, that's great. I, I think we don't quite have time for that, but that's really great. Uh, so, uh, well, I, we've gone through questions, but anybody have any now they want to want to raise their hand and ask or any comments to share? People are busy playing away with it. Um, okay, well, anything, any final words you guys want to share? Just thank you so much, and please let us know uh, how we can help. And um, you know, if you guys would like a, an API key, uh, happy to pass some out. You know, we have this API key that's available for the next month. Please do keep that uh, close to your chest, so to speak, um, in the sense that uh, we don't we don't want to get it out there <laughs> too wide. But um, 
yeah, happy to work with everybody um, and and do some one on ones. We do one on ones with people quite often. Uh, BLM specifically showing their teams how to use the API to batch download stuff. So, um, you know, this is an exciting time. Uh, it is a bit scary too, right? There's a lot of unknowns, and I captured some of those in my presentation at the very end. You know, what are the costs? Uh, you know, and the honest truth is you, you kind of don't know until you know. Right? So that's what we're helping Steve at NOAA, uh, Drop Doc, uh, figure out, right? It's like, hey, if I do this every single day, what's it going to cost? Okay, well, let's figure it out, you know? Um, so happy to work with you through those, through those things. And in my experience so far, it's like, wow, that's totally worth it, you know? Like, we, we aren't racking up you know, tens of thousands of dollars, right? Um, it's it's totally worth it not to have to deal with this stuff on our own computers. Um, right. Yeah. Well, you you guys have clearly uh, shown some really aha moments, and uh, I'm sure there'll be more to come. And uh, even the the graph you pulled up, Justin, you said, "Oh boy, this gives some questions." Right. That's exact. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing to get the data showing a certain way that then raises more questions than gives hopefully gives answers, but also then raises questions. So we really, you know, NIDIS is so proud of you guys, and uh, we really do hope this, this tool will be useful to you all state climatologists and others still on. Thanks, guys. And if you have questions, we are gonna, we are recording this. We'll get it out on the web and, and make sure you all have a link so you can uh, work through it again. So thank so you. How do, how, do we, how do we ask questions? Is there contact information for particular categories of questions? Going forward, yeah. What would you guys yeah. propose? I'm just asking. Is there? Yeah, I yeah. Know, yeah. There are email addresses on the slide deck, so I don't know how to well, ask. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> I forgot to put my email on there. Uh, I'm putting it on there right now as we speak. Uh, okay, thank you. Yep. And then we have uh, questions, uh, suggestions, a link on the on the Climate Engine app too. But uh, yeah, feel free to 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 reach out uh, directly to me. Yeah, just obviously everyone, you can imagine Justin's pretty damn busy, but um, oh, just, okay. so I can we'll, I can sync you up with the right folks. Great. OK, thanks, everybody, for being with us. And thanks again to you, Climate Engine Wizards. Really appreciated your time today. Thank you. Thank you.